During the Second World War, resistance movements sprung up throughout Nazi-occupied Europe, unlike in the Allied Armed Forces of the time, where it was men who were fighting exclusively on the battlefields, these resistance movements saw women playing key roles in the fighting. Freddy and Truss Overstegen and Hanni Schaft were three such prominent members of the Dutch resistance movement, and they used a variety of tactics to accomplish their goals. Before we get into the video, please consider subscribing if you enjoy this type of content. Thanks. Hanni Schaft was born as Janetje Joanna Schaft in the city of Haarlem in the north of the Netherlands on the 16th of September 1920. Schaft came from a family which was immersed in liberal politics. Her father Peter Schaft was a member of the Social Democratic Workers' Party, the Dutch Socialist Party which wanted to see the Netherlands abandon the monarchy and become a full republic, but which despite garnering much support in the 1920s, was kept out of power in the Netherlands by a coalition of conservative parties. From a young age, Schaft was encouraged to take strong political stances by her parents, and in 1938, she began studying law at the University of Amsterdam with a view to becoming a human rights lawyer. There she met and befriended two Jewish women, Sandra Frank and Philippe Polak. They would later play a part in Schaft's story. The Overstegen sisters, Truce and Freddy, were born on the 29th of August 1923 and the 6th of September 1925 respectively, in the village of Schotten, in the north of the Netherlands, near the city of Haarlem, where Schaft had been born a few years before them. Their parents divorced when they were young and thereafter, the sisters were raised by their mother in Harlem, where they relocated. They lived in largely poor circumstances, at one time dwelling on a barge on the Spahn River. However, they, like Schaft, were soon receiving an education in political action. Truce and Freddy's mother was a communist, and helped to give shelter to refugees who were fleeing from political persecution in regions in Eastern Europe which were experiencing political turmoil throughout the 1920s and 1930s. By the end of the 1930s, when Truce and Freddy were in their teenage years, these refugees were increasingly Jewish people, fleeing persecution orchestrated by the Nazi regime which had taken over Germany in 1933. Soon, those same Nazis would be impacting on the Netherlands. After the Second World War broke out in September 1939, Western Europe was initially spared any bloodshed. There was even talk of a phony war. But then, in a blistering series of military campaigns in the spring and summer of 1940, the Germans conquered Denmark and Norway first, and then headed west into France and the Low Countries. Despite the Netherlands being neutral in the war at the time, Germany invaded the country on the 10th of May 1940. On the 14th, the Germans conducted a vicious bombing campaign against the city of Rotterdam, which left tens of thousands of homes destroyed and killed over 1,000 people. The following day, Dutch forces surrendered, and the monarchy fled into exile. Thousands of German troops now occupied key locations throughout the country, and the administration of the Netherlands was carried out by Nazi officials. Like in the other countries such as France, which was conquered within a matter of weeks after the surrender of the Netherlands, a resistance movement against the Nazi occupation of the Netherlands soon emerged. Much of this was led by the Dutch Communist movement, which in February 1491 called for a general strike in the country in response to German efforts to begin arresting the country's Jewish people. Thereafter, Numerous other resistance groups emerged, and there were many opposition groups operating throughout the country by 1943. The Elverstegen sisters were soon involved in the resistance movement. Though Truce and Freddy were still only 16 and 14 years of age, they began joining their mother almost as soon as the country was occupied in distributing anti-Nazi newspapers for the communist branch of the resistance. In an interview which Freddie gave many years later to the journalist Ellis Jonker, she recalled them also gluing warnings over Nazi posters 
which had been put up in Harlem, looking to recruit Dutchmen to go and work in Germany. Here she laughed at the idea of them engaging in this subversive activity before riding home on their bicycles. While it was entirely unorthodox to have two teenage girls fighting a Third Reich, in a way, Freddy and Truce's youth was the perfect disguise. After all, who would suspect a 14-year-old girl of being the person who planted a bomb? And that was the logic of the resistance commander, Franz van der Veel, who asked the sister's mother in 1941 if they would officially undertake work for the movement. She agreed, and soon the sisters, who were at least now 17 and 15, were being trained to sabotage bridges and railway lines. Meanwhile, Shaft had also begun to engage in resistance activity, driven by outrage at the anti-Jewish policies being introduced in the Netherlands aimed at people like her two close friends, Sonja and Feline. She soon became involved in small acts of resistance against the occupying forces. Her principal approach was to steal ID cards for her Jewish friends so that they could walk the streets of Harlem without being apprehended for being Jewish. However, in the spring of 1943, these limited acts of subversion on her part were transformed into something much greater when the Nazi regime passed a law which required all university students to sign a loyalty declaration to Nazi Germany. It even included a clause that anyone who signed it would commit to working in Germany for some time after graduating, a component of the Nazis' policy of attempting to Germanize the Netherlands. Schaft refused to sign it. This in itself was not unusual. 80% of Dutch university students did likewise, but Schaft's actions thereafter were unusual. She now returned home to live with her parents, bringing Sonja and Feline with her, so that they could continue to hide from the Nazi authorities who would send them to one of Europe's many concentration camps if they were identified. Schaft also joined the Council of Resistance, a resistance movement associated with the Dutch Communists at this time, and it was through this that she would soon come to know the Overstegen sisters. It was also when she joined the resistance that Jonicher acquired her more commonly used name, Hanny, the secret name given to her by the resistance. Meanwhile, Truce and Freddy were already seasoned resistance fighters, though still teenagers. An early assignment involved burning down a Nazi warehouse. Soon, they were involved in drive-by shootings of Nazi soldiers on bicycles. Dutch collaborators with the regime were also common targets, as were German officers, and as the sisters got older as the war went on, they began using flirtation as a weapon. On one occasion, Truce, who was 20 in 1943, began flirting with a German SS officer in a restaurant while Freddy kept watch outside. Then, Truce lured the man outside, asking if he'd accompany her for a walk to the woods so they could be alone. The officer accepted, but then they, coincidentally, ran into a friend of Truce's. But this, of course, was all set up. Following this, the friend said, Girl, you know you're not supposed to be here. After apologising, they turned around and walked the other way, and it was then that Truce's fellow resistance fighter shot and killed the German officer. This practice of luring German officers and soldiers into secluded places before killing them became a common practice. Well, this occurred various times, and the younger Freddy would do the same. She was small and innocent looking, especially as she wore her hair in two braids. Many Nazi soldiers and collaborators would have been thrilled flirting with her in taverns and even more excited after she suggested a romantic stroll in the nearby forest. Yet little did these men know that they were being lured here to be fatally shot in a surprise attack. But it was not all sabotage and killings. The pair were also heavily involved in helping to rescue Jewish children by smuggling them out of the Netherlands. Having joined the resistance, Hanny was quickly introduced to Truce and Freddy. They soon became inseparable, 
and began running operations together, Truce acting as their unofficial leader. Several assassinations were carried out by them, and they also engaged in sabotage acts against railway lines into Harlem to slow Nazi supplies into the region as the Allies prepared to open a new front in Western Europe. However, while the three young women had no qualms about killing German officers and soldiers, or even Dutch collaborators, they would not accept every assignment offered to them. For instance, when they were requested to kidnap the children of the Reich Commissioner, Arthur Says Inquart, who effectively acted as the Nazi governor of the Netherlands, they refused. The plan was to trade the children afterwards for the release of Dutch resistance fighters who had been arrested. But the women realised that if the plan ran into trouble, they would have to kill the children. They refused on the basis that we are no Hitlerites and that resistance fighters don't murder children. In the summer of 1944, things were looking up for Hanny and the Elverstegans. On the 6th of June, the Western Allies led by Britain and the USA had opened a new front in northern France. It was only a matter of time before Western Europe was liberated and the war was won. However, just over two weeks later on the 21st of June, an incident occurred which would have fateful consequences for Hanny Shaft. That day, she and a fellow resistance fighter, Jan Bonkamp, carried out an assassination of a Dutch collaborator called Willem Ragut. They killed Ragut, but Bonkamp was wounded very badly during a shootout, and he was later arrested. While seeking medical attention, he inadvertently revealed Shaft's identity to some nurses disguised as resistance fighters who subsequently passed the information to the authorities. Though Hanny was able to go underground to escape arrest, her parents were arrested instead to pressure her into surrendering herself. Eventually the crisis passed. Her parents were released after two months and Hanny, who was now known to the occupation forces as the girl with the red hair, was able to return to her sabotage and assassination activities, albeit with her hair dyed black. Yet the incident in the summer of 1944 would prove fatal in the end. In the course of the autumn and winter of 1944, the Western Allies, who had conquered northern France and parts of Belgium in the late summer and early autumn of 1944, decided to leave most of the Netherlands under Nazi occupation and proceed eastwards into Germany. The idea was that an attempt to liberate the Netherlands would result in needless casualties as the Germans there would surrender once Berlin was conquered. That decision would be the death of Hanny Schaft. The occupation forces in Harlem had not forgotten who she was, and on the 21st of March 1945, as the Battle of Berlin was nearing its conclusion to the east, Schaft was arrested at a checkpoint while carrying resistance documentation. She was sent to Amsterdam, where she was questioned and tortured, before she was eventually identified by her red hair. Despite the fact that there was an agreement in place between the Allies and the German occupation forces in the Netherlands, that executions and reprisals against resistance fighters in the country would not be carried out in the final stages of the war, in return for the Allies sending extensive food and medical supplies into the Netherlands. Hanny Schaft was nevertheless executed near Bloemendaal by Dutch Nazi officials on the 17th of April 1945. She was 24 years old at the time. The war ended just 18 days later. Seven months later, in November 1945, her body was exhumed from its grave and she was provided with a state funeral at which she was referred to as the symbol of the resistance. Shortly after the war ended, Truce Overstegen married Piet Menger, a fellow resistance fighter. They subsequently had four children together, the eldest of which was named after Hanny Schaft. Truce principally became an artist and sculptor, but she also lectured regularly on topics relating to her wartime activity and on anti-Semitism and set up the National Hanny Schaft Foundation. In 1982, she published a memoir entitled Not Then, Not Now, Not Ever. 
Freddie also married after the war to Jan Decker, an engineer at a local steel factory. Together they had three children, however her later life was somewhat troubled as she had flashbacks about what happened during the war and suffered from insomnia. She was deeply troubled by Hanny's death, but was also reluctant to talk about her experiences. Yet, despite her ambivalent thoughts on her wartime heroism, Freddie served on the board of the Hanny Shaft Foundation with her sister in the post-war years. Quite fittingly, both sisters lived long lives. Truce died in 2016 at 92 years of age, while Freddie passed away two years later, a day before her 93rd birthday. Shortly before this, in 2014, they were jointly awarded the Mobilisation War Cross by the Dutch government, a medal awarded to those who had served with distinction in the Netherlands during the Second World War. Thank you so much everyone for watching this video on the Elvis Stegen sisters and Hanny Shaft, I hope you enjoyed. Let me know what you thought of their lives down below in the comments and if you'd like more videos on these topics let me know in the comments also. If you have any suggestions be sure to leave them down as well and I hope you guys have notifications turned on so you get all my videos as soon as I upload them. Anyway, that's all from me, so I'll see all of you in the next Forgotten Life. Thanks.